It's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Happy for the presence of each one, especially those of you that are visiting with us. We're certainly thankful that you've come to be with us again. In uh, the lesson of the hour, I'd like to speak about the responsibilities and blessings within the local church. What is the local church? What's the work that it's supposed to do? Uh, identifying with the local church and the blessings and responsibilities that we have in this uh, uh, set up or organization that God has appointed for us to work together in. So responsibility in the local church, it is something that's a greatly misunderstood subject like I guess almost every Bible subject. Uh, but we want to look at these four points. What is a local church and what... Uh, you know, how do we recognize passages talking about that and what uh, is the distinction with the universal church? What works are we to do together in the local church as God has appointed it and authorized it? Uh, how do we identify with the local church uh, and the blessings and responsibilities? First of all, let's uh, make the distinction with, uh, you know, when we read our Bibles, we have to use... Uh, uh, some understanding about what a word means in a particular context, and the word church, as we've discussed in other lessons, has you know different connotations in different uh, passages of scriptures that we read. Uh, you know, it's always amazing when you look in Webster's Dictionary how many different ways in which we use different uh, English words. And in the New Testament, we talk about the church, um, you know, as the Called out assembly is the basic meaning. The assembly of uh, the faithful people in the Old Testament is used that way at least on one occasion in the New Testament to talk about the church in the wilderness. But uh, many times the church is speaking of the universal church. All of those that have been called out of the world by the gospel and that have become Christians. Those that have been added by God to His fellowship and to a right relationship with Him. When we think about the church... Uh, uh, universal, it's all of the saved, of course, that have lived uh, before or uh, now that are in heaven would, would make up uh, the church. And it has no organization for, dis for uh, decision making. There's no central headquarters here in this world for the church in its universal sense. Jesus Christ is the head of the church and all Individual believers are the body. We are all individual members in that body. There's no universal oversight that's been set up to govern the church universal in this world. There's no universal treasury that we contribute into to do joint work together with all other Christians all over the world in every place. There's not a collective work that's been assigned for us to do together. So many passages talk about the universal church. And the universal church is really speaking about our fellowship with God. And it is the most important relationship that we have. It is the one that comes before all others. Nothing should separate us from this relationship we have with our God through Jesus Christ. There is one church, one called out body that Christ saves. And we need to be in that body that Christ is the head of, in that saved relationship. We are baptized into it, and God adds us to it, we're told in Galatians 3.27. And we are components, when we talk about the components of it, it's made up of individual Christians. It's not made up of, of congregations, it's made up of individuals that are the uh, components of that body, members of that body. Uh, true fellowship with God is what uh, we talk about the church in the universal sense, uh, the firm foundation of God stands. The Lord knows those that are His. <laughs> he knows who's in the universal church. He knows who's really saved and who isn't. And we need to keep that relationship right with our God by being faithful and doing His will as it's revealed to us in the New Testament. And God is the one in charge of that. There's nobody that can kick you out of the, your relationship with the Lord except the Lord Himself. And uh, there's not anybody that can put you in <laughs> except the Lord. So he controls the membership when we're talking about this saved relationship. And all that remain in it, uh, faithful until death, are certainly going to be saved. Jesus is the Savior of the body. What constitutes a local church? 
And what work is it to do? There's a second sense here in which the word church is used. It talks about those local uh, teams of Christians that get together in a locality and work together in a local arrangement according to God's pattern that's found in the New Testament. You have a plurality of Christians and they have an agreement to work together and worship together to do the things collectively God has assigned for Christians to do. And this uh, agreement can be tacit or you know, explicit, but it, yet it's an agreement we all recognize that we have to do these things together and to work together. Uh, we have a kindred spirit and wanting to serve God according to the New Testament pattern and please the Lord and do these collective things He's commanded. And we work and worship as partners here in Mustang as a local church. And it's God's will that we do so. It's a command that we uh, worship together with other saints, that we don't forsake our assembling together on the first day of the week and so on, that we come together to break bread. You know, those are things that are assigned for us to do. So we have to seek out other brethren in a local arrangement like this in order to do those things. And each local church is something distinct from all other local congregations. Um, so a distinct congregation with members, they act as a unit together. That's a local church. And it has its servants of a local church. We have our deacons here. And other members, whatever, whoever we are in whatever service we do on behalf of the group, this church at Mustang has servants. The church at Jerusalem, we have an example of them sending uh, Judas and Silas up to the congregation that was in Antioch to go up there. And uh, when that letter was delivered from the church to tell about the apostles and elders that had looked into the question of do Gentiles have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be good Christians? And of course the answer was no. Uh, in Acts 15.22, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders and the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas, and Silas leading men among the brethren. So you have a distinct team of saints, <laughs> congregation, there, a local church in Jerusalem, and they have servants, and they command these servants, appoint them to go up there and do a work for them in going to Antioch. In Romans 16, 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at Sincrea. So there was a church outside of the city of Corinth in another small city there called Sincrea, the port city, and Phoebe had been a servant in that local congregation. She was going to relocate evidently to Rome and Paul sent a letter saying that they should receive her, welcome her when she gets there in that other congregation. So we have these distinct local congregations that are mentioned with their own members and servants and oversight. Uh, they had an authorized oversight according to God's word. It's uh, God's purpose when the local church is fully organized according to God's plan that we have elders, overseers, shepherds. They're, all those terms are used for the same group of men. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 37, in the beginning before they were able to appoint elders there in Jerusalem, the apostles were in charge. It says and they, a man who owned a tract of land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So under their, their charge, they had an oversight over that treasury. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and uh, Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. So there's a local church there in the city of Philippi. And we see how it was organized. They had overseers or elders and they had deacons that were there among those saints. In Acts 14, 23, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So as Paul went about preaching the gospel on his first missionary journey, those people that, that were converted formed a local church, and then they appointed elders in those local churches. And so they had local oversight. And their oversight only applied to that congregation. It didn't go to any other congregations. They were all autonomous and independent of each other. 
But on, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So they are to look over these saints that are among them, the flock that was among them, these elders. Uh, that came there from Ephesus that Paul was talking to in Acts 20 and verse 28. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ, and a partaker also in the glory that is to be revealed. So they had in those local churches, when Peter sent out that general letter to the churches, he said, the elders among you I'm exhorting. Each congregation had their own elders. And they were a distinct group with their own membership there. And they had their own treasury. Part of what unites us in collective work is that on the first day of the week, we all lay aside into the treasury of this local church and we're able to uh, do evangelistic works collectively through that by supporting evangelists and um, getting teaching material and so on, taking care of this building that we have to meet in. We have a, a treasury that makes us a distinct group from everybody else. We've got our own treasury. It's, we're a local church here. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also on the first day of every week. Let each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collection be made when I come. Let lay us put aside and save. Put into the treasury is the idea. So there won't be a collection. They were taking a collection, so there wouldn't be a collection, right? When Paul showed up, they wouldn't have to raise this money. So they had collective treasury there that they put their money into to do their collective work through which made them distinct and they had collective work to do for Christ in that local church just as we do here in Mustang and other congregations do the local church at Jerusalem and Antioch let's see these qualities these things going on with each of these congregations they were baptized believers that were worshiping together regularly devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to prayer, and to fellowship, and they had agreement, obligations toward each other, to look out for each other, and to support each other. And they had a common oversight. There in the beginning they had the apostles. Later they appointed elders. They laid money into a common treasury that they took care of the needy saints and the work that that local church needed to do. They had a collective work of relieving needy saints. One of the things they did was to make sure there was not a needy person among them as Christians that didn't have their basic necessities that they needed. And uh, people gave into the treasury, and then out of that treasury they took care of those needy saints in chapter 4. They were subject to discipline in the local church. If you didn't behave yourself properly, uh, God Himself judged Ananias and Sapphira there through... Uh, Peter, when he delivered that sentence to him because he had lied to the Holy Spirit, fear came upon the whole church. They relieved the needy widows, both the uh, Hebrew widows, Christians, and Greek-speaking uh, widows. They wanted to make sure they were all taken care of in the daily serving of food there in chapter 6. And they sent to relieve needy brethren. When you talk about the church at Antioch, they heard about a famine that had come. And they made a determination that each one was able. They were giving in to the treasury to do this work. And they sent Silas and or, uh, Paul and Barnabas down to the elders of the churches of Judea and dropped uh, that contribution off at different places because those churches weren't able to take care of all of their needy during that famine. And so, again, we have a local church working through their treasury, the distinct group there. And some belonged to the church were persecuted, we're told in the book of Acts in chapter 12, in verses 1 through 12. Herod uh, uh, Agrippa II, he comes, or Herod Agrippa I comes along and he persecutes the church. He put to death James, the Lord's brother, and then he arrested Peter when he saw that pleased the Jewish uh, leaders there. Uh, now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. In verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but prayers for him was being made fervently by the church to God. So 
So those brethren met together there in that local church. They prayed for Peter. And of course God delivered him uh, from that situation that he was in. We must be identified with a local church. Or we could ask the question, must you be? Well, if we're following the pattern we see in the New Testament, people, when they went from one place to another, they sought to be identified with the church. They sought to uh, get together and be able to fully collectively work with a local church. In my time as a Christian, I've been identified with 12 different local churches at different times during my life. And uh, each time it resulted in a lot of blessings and a lot of responsibilities every place that I was. But that was part of God's plan for our work as a Christian and our life to please Him is that we work together with brethren in uh, the locality that we're at that we try to do so. The collective work of evangelism, edification, and benevolence has been assigned to the local church. And we need to do those works, see the value and blessings, uh, and then also meet our obligations to God. Uh, there's no one way that's set forth as a way to identify, but some way or another we need to let it be known we want to be considered a member of this local church. And uh, the elders, the lo uh, our representatives of the local church need to recognize that, come to the, uh, uh, the decision to, to accept that person as a member of that congregation. So let it be known that you want to join when you've looked uh, and seen that things are scriptural and done right and it's something that you want to be a part of, then you need to do so. Every Christian is to join a local church when he has the opportunity to do this work with others. We have a, a approved example of Saul or Paul when he came from working up in Damascus, he came down to Jerusalem and he wanted to be joined to the brethren that were there so that he could work together with them in these spiritual things. Uh, when he came to Jerusalem, we're told in Acts 9 and verses 26 through 28, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate or, or join himself or keep company with, is the idea of the word there, trying to associate with the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. So he wanted to associate. The word there means to be glued, to stick to cleave in this kind of a context, to join, to keep company, to join oneself to one as an associate. He wanted to be a part of that local church there and work together with the brethren there in Jerusalem. And he uh, set an example that all of us ought to follow. We ought to imitate Paul as he follows Christ. And here is an example for us to follow. He tried to identify himself with that church so they could do these common practices together and cooperate with one another in the things the Lord wants us to do. And be uh, just as conscientious as Paul. Isn't that a good idea? Just do like Paul did. Think, think that it's important like Paul thought it was important. And the church at first refused Paul. And they had an obligation to make sure that they were receiving somebody that was in fellowship with God, right? That, uh, before they're going to be in fellowship with the local church. And they were suspicious about Saul. They'd heard about the things he did in persecuting. Maybe some of them had experienced some of it in their own family before. But they got testimony from Barnabas, who was a prophet, and he told them about Paul and showed that he certainly was one now that was a Christian and being faithful and preaching the truth. And so they received him. He was with them. And they did the right thing. They recognized one that God recognized was right. We're told that uh, the local church has an obligation to exercise its autonomy and who it extends fellowship to and who it doesn't. In Galatians 2, 9, And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Now we decide who it is we extend fellowship to. 
people that we recognize that are being faithful and that are in a right relationship with the Lord based on what we know. And when Paul and Barnabas came there, the apostles recognized that. And they extended to them the right hand of fellowship. And they recognized they were faithful Christians too and they wanted to uh, work together with them in the Lord. They'll take, they would go to the Gentiles and preach and the others would continue their work mainly among uh, the Jewish people. And again, you have to be careful. We're told that we're not to give fellowship to those that are immoral. Even though they're, oh, they're a so-called brother, they're not acting like the Lord wants them to. If they're out of fellowship with the Lord, then the local church can't have fellowship with them. Right? So it is something that the elders have to be careful about, and making sure that somebody uh, you know, stands uh, for being faithful and obedient to the Lord in the way the Scriptures teach. And if the people won't repent, we're not to be in fellowship. We're even to disfellowship a member of a local church if they're going to walk disorderly. So... We have that uh, autonomy that has to be exercised in the local church. And make, that, uh, make a careful evaluation of that. We don't want to refuse fellowship to anyone that is right with the Lord. And yet we don't want to extend fellowship to anyone we know isn't right with the Lord too. So letters were sent in the early church to help identify the faithful to recommend a brother or sister when they were moving from one congregation to go work in another congregation, some other city. Uh, so letters to identify the faithful in Acts chapter 18 and verse 27. And when he, talking about Bar, uh, Apollos, and when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. So he was a member there in Ephesus. The church at Ephesus wrote a letter ahead to endorse him so the church at Corinth over there would recognize him. The church in Achaia, uh, they would recognize him and shows a good practice. In uh, the case of Phoebe, we mentioned that. She was going to Rome uh, from Ephesus and the, there was a letter, letter sent on her behalf or um, you have Timothy, he was going to Philippi, and uh, Paul reminds them just how faithful he was. He didn't have anybody like Timothy, faithful like Timothy, that would serve like he would, <laughs> like a son. And they certainly should want to have fellowship with him when he got there. You have the opposite uh, happening with Diotrephes. He was a man, uh, evidently an elder of the church. Uh, thought he was at least the chief head of the local church. And even though he got letters from the Apostle John endorsing people, he wouldn't accept them. He even put faithful people out of the church that were right with God as far as their universal church relationship, but yet he wouldn't accept them in the local church. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. <laughs> so you got, we've got to avoid two extremes there, right? We want to fellowship those that are right and, and not be wicked. <laughs> And then we want to make sure we don't fellowship those that are being immoral and unfaithful and uh, get into problems that way. But there is a local membership, a local church, and a local, uh, a local members that identify there. After we're baptized, we are added to the universal church, this saved relationship, this fellowship with God. When we come up out of that water, we're saved, right? We're in the church, but as far as a local church, we have to identify ourselves with that. We're told in Acts chapter 2 and verses 41 and 42, So then those who had received His word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of, prayer, breaking of bread and to prayer. So we need to join ourselves and join in the work of a local church after we're baptized. Uh, if we are restored to Christ, after we've, if someone's fallen out uh, and back into the world, they should 
repent and have their sins forgiven and then they should identify with a local church and get to work doing the Lord's work. You must get involved in that work to be fully what the Lord wants you to be as a Christian and as a servant. We don't read about floating memberships in the New Testament where people just floated around and weren't subject to any eldership anywhere or uh, didn't have any uh, contribution into the treasury and work with a local church in their collective work. So blessings of the Lord's membership. It's a beautiful thing. The Lord gives us the commandments He does because He loves us and He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to go to heaven. And part of that is being a part of a local group of Christians doing these things together. It builds us up mutually and helps us to be the Christians that we should be, the servants that we ought to be. They come together to worship uh, with those of like precious faith. They gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread, take the Lord's Supper together. And uh, we should do that as well because it is a blessing to do so, to uh, share our holy faith with one another, uh, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. That is a blessing to be able to get together with other Christians and have that mutual edification that happens when we sing together and to be able to have Bible classes and study together. Knowing people want to help you is such a blessing that every local church I've ever been a part of, it's a great blessing to know there were other brethren there that loved me, that had obligations toward me if I got into difficulty, that they'd help me spiritually and even physically if necessary. And uh, if I falter, there's somebody that was going to try to turn me from the error of my way, like we're told. In Galatians chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, there'd be someone spiritually minded that would try to restore you. Right? That's a powerful thing to have people looking out for your soul, to turn you from the error of your way. Jan, Jan, James chapter 5 verses 19 and 20, save your soul from death. To have somebody, if you get hungry or you're without clothing, to know that your local brethren... Even if nobody, else, if nobody else is there to help you, they would help you to make sure you had clothing, to make sure you had enough to eat. That's a blessing to be a part of a local church. The local church worked together to sound out the Word of God. We we're able to do collectively through the treasury and through our servants here uh, much good in sharing the gospel and sending forth the Word. Genuine friendship. We have people to weep with and to rejoice with in this local church. That is a great blessing to have those kinds of friends and that kind of relationship. So many great blessings, but also responsibilities. God has designed and regulated our relationships in all different areas of our life. We're to be good citizens as members of our physical nation that we live in. We ought to be good husbands, good wives, obedient children. We ought to uh, Have a good relationship with whoever we work for, people that work with us. The Word of God gives us teaching on how to conduct ourselves in all of these different areas of our life. And it gives us instruction on how we work together under the oversight of a local church and elders. Recognize the discipline that goes on there. We have a responsibility to work together when discipline is necessary and to make sure that that's carried out properly and that we're a a faithful part of it. Submit to the leaders and walk worthy, walk to maintain harmony in the local church, to be at peace with one another is a command that we have. We're to worship together to edify one another, encourage one another. We need to be thinking always, whether it's in our classes or worship and all of the things that we do, that we're speaking words that edify, that build up, that help promote uh, the upbuilding of one another taking the Lord's Supper together, singing, praying, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension is what Paul said we need to have men doing that in every place. Hearing and teaching and encouraging, that's our responsibility in the local church. And we need to be busy doing it in this place here in Mustang. And give in to the treasury. We're not to let other people uh, do all of the supporting of the cause and the doing of the work. We have a command, each one of us as we are prospered, to give on the first day of the week. And finally, we want to extend the Lord's invitation this morning. If you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, we want to encourage you to do so. 
so that God can add you to His body, the church, that you can be saved from your sins and you can be right with Him. We're told in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Those brethren in Jerusalem were teaching the gospel and those that heard that gospel and obeyed it were being saved and the Lord was adding those people when they were saved to the church, to their number. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The Holy Spirit has revealed to us the plan of salvation. And by that Holy Spirit's teaching that we find in the gospel, we've been motivated to believe in Christ, repent of our sins, and be baptized into this one body of the saved. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. If you're not right with the Lord, we want to encourage you to set yourself right today. If you need to be baptized into Christ, we would love to assist you in doing that today so that you can leave here knowing that you're in the body of Christ and saved. If you need the prayers as a Christian of the church, they're offered to you. If you have any need, won't you let us know as together we stand and sing.